Hello everyone, I'm Ms. Davis and today we're going to be looking at viruses. Viruses are non-cellular, therefore they cannot be considered a living thing. All living things must be composed of at least one cell. Well, viruses don't have cells, so they're not considered living. So then why are we discussing viruses if they're not living? Well, they do affect every living thing from bacteria all the way up to us as humans. Viruses are composed of two main parts, the covering and the inner core. This covering of all viruses is called a capsid and it's composed of proteins. And so here you can see a capsid in several of these examples. This capsid provides the shape of the virus. Some viruses also have an envelope as part of their covering as you can see here. These are seen in animal viruses. Um, they use the envelope to hide from your immune system and to help them also gain access into your cells. The inner core of a virus is composed of what we call nucleic acid. A nucleic acid can be either DNA or RNA. It can also be a single-stranded a DNA or RNA molecule or a double-stranded, meaning there are two. RNA viruses are unique because they have to actually work backwards. Okay, they start with the RNA and they have to work backwards to create DNA, which you see here with the HIV virus. These are called retroviruses, and again, HIV is a, an example of this. This gives the virus lots of ways to hold its genetic information. Some viruses also contain various proteins that can act as enzymes. They help speed up their reproduction when they infect cells, and again, HIV has these, you can see here. Now, here are a number of different types of viruses, and they can be classified by their type of nucleic acid core, and also their size and shape. So over here we have the tobacco mosaic virus, and you'll see here that it's a rod-shaped virus. The adenovirus, which is what causes the common cold, this is what we would consider an isohedral shape. And you'll notice that tobacco mosaic virus has RNA, whereas the adenovirus has DNA. Influenza virus is what causes the flu, and you'll see here that it also has an envelope as well as being RNA. The last one is a bacteriophage. Bacteriophages only infect bacteria, but again, you can see how its structure is very different. Now, viruses can reproduce inside of a living cell. No living cell is immune to viral infections. Viruses can infect animals, plants, fungi, protists, and even bacteria cells. Viruses that infect bacteria cells are called bacteriophages, and here's a picture of what they look like. Once the virus gains access into the cell, it will begin reproducing. We're going to look at two life cycles viruses um, use, and we're going to focus on this example, which is the bacteriophage. The first life cycle is called the lytic cycle. During the lytic cycle, the virus re reproduces and the host cell undergoes what we call lysis. Now lysis means that the host cell is going to rupture and release new viruses in the process. The lytic cycle can be divided into five stages, as you can see here. So let's talk about each of these stages. The first stage is attachment, and this is when the capsid of the virus is going to bind to the host cell. Okay, so see how it's attaching to the host cell. The second stage is penetration, and this is when the virus injects the nucleic acid core into the cell. Now that the genetic information for the virus is inside the cell, the third stage, which is called biosynthesis, can begin. The virus then hijacks the cell organelles and forces the cell to begin manufacturing viral parts. Stage four is what we call maturation. This is when the cell begins to assemble the new viruses so they can get ready to be released. The last stage is release, and this is when the host cell is going to rupture or open up, and it's going to release all the newly made viruses. Each virus now can go attack a new cell. The second life cycle of a virus is called the lysogenic cycle, and you can see it's added over here on the side. During this cycle, the virus has an extra stage between penetration and biosynthesis. This new stage is called integration, and this is when the viral genetic information is incorporated into the host cell. It's put into the host cell's DNA. This means that viral reproduction does not take place immediately or right away. The virus can sit latent inside the cell, silent, almost like it's sleeping or dormant. At this point, the virus is called a prophage because it's not doing anything, so it's just called a prophage. If the host cell divides into two cells, each cell is going to get a copy of this viral DNA, so each cell is still infected. 
Different conditions can trigger the prophage to move back into the lytic cycle like you can see here. Then it will undergo biosynthesis, maturation, and then finally release where the host cell does die and rupture. In this picture, you can see how the two life cycles are linked together. So we have the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. Now, all living things are subject to viral infections. However, viruses have to evolve and develop unique ways to invade these different types of cells. Plant viruses have to have special ways to gain access into the cell since the plants are protected by bark a lot of times, or the fact that each cell in a plant cell is protected by a cell wall. Even with these obstacles, though, there are about 2,000 kinds of plant diseases that are caused by viruses. An example of a plant disease can be seen here. This is called TMV, or the tobacco mosaic virus. You can see how here it's affecting the leaves of the plant. Well, guys, the leaves are what do the photosynthesis, and so this can ultimately kill the plant if the plant cannot do photosynthesis and make its own food. Sometimes plants are given viruses on purpose. Um, Rembrandt tulips that you see here have a unique coloration, and this coloration is due to a virus. But the plant is weakened because we do this. And because the virus is present, it, the plant doesn't live very long. Okay, so this gives you an example of how we can actually use the virus, though, to create something that's unique and different, like you see here with these tulips. Now, viral infections can be a major problem for humans. Here in America, some viral diseases are not common uh, because we do have vaccines. So things like measles, mumps, and polio are not seen very often here because most children are given vaccines for these viral diseases. Chickenpox will soon be one of these as well um, because they are giving the vaccine for chickenpox now. But when we look at this, a flu, they give flu vac vaccines every year because there are many different strains of the flu virus. So they have to guess which one is going to be the problem for this particular season and they create a vaccine. Well, if they guess wrong or you get exposed to a different flu virus, you can still get the flu even if you've gotten the flu shot. Now, new emergent diseases can be a problem um, and can spread very quickly when they first come into a population. That's why there was the big scare over H1N1, which was the type of flu. H1N1 is a combination of swine flu, which is pig flu, avian flu, which is bird flu, and human flu. And so it's those three mixed together. It's like they've mutated together. Now, these are just a few of the viruses that can um, affect humans, and here's a list from your book. Some that are sexually transmitted, of course, are AIDS, genital warts, and genital herpes. Um, some childhood diseases, which we don't see much anymore, are mumps, measles, chicken pox, and the German measles. Respiratory diseases, which means they're going to um, affect your lungs and your respiratory system, of course, the common cold, influenza, and what we also call SARS, which is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Skin diseases are things like warts, fever blisters, and shingles. Now, shingles, guys, is a type of chickenpox mutation. So if you've had chickenpox before, or if you've even had the vaccine, you could get shingles. Um, there's some digestive issues, nervous system diseases, like rabies. You've heard about rabies before. Rabies are carried by, like, dogs or rodents or something like that. And then, of course, other diseases like smallpox, hemorrhagic fevers. Some cancers are linked to viruses. Okay, yellow fever, um, hepatitis C, and so on. Other ones can even be Ebola, West Nile virus, and Hantavirus. West Nile has been an issue where it's getting closer and closer in many places in the United States because they're carried by mosquitoes. Hantavirus is a problem in northern New Mexico because it's carried by deer mice and it's up there. Okay, so these are just some examples. Now, in order to control viral infections in, in the human populations, first we need public awareness. So when there's an outbreak of these diseases, the public needs to be aware of them. Just like with the mosquito issue, we know that they carry West Nile, so you need to be careful of um, pr and protect yourself against mosquito bites, okay, by putting on bug spray or something like that. Also, vector control is important. So if it's carried by a mosquito or a certain type of mouse or rabies is carried by a dog, you would watch for those vectors. Now, I'm not saying you go out and kill all dogs or whatever, but with, with mosquitoes, we can spray to help uh, decrease the amount of mosquitoes by killing the larvae and these puddles and stuff that do remain after it rains. And then last, of course, is creating vaccines. Some of these viruses you cannot create vaccines for, like the common cold. There are thousands of variations of the common cold, so they can't do a vaccine for it. But vaccines like for chickenpox, measles, polio, things like that are very important because it helps keep those diseases out of our populations. 
Now, this is going to conclude our lecture on viruses. I know it was pretty quick, but I hope you get a better understanding of their structure and also their life cycles on how they um, produce new viruses. If you have any questions, please let me know, and we'll continue with bacteria in the next lecture. Have a good day.